What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and bring it to you raw. Got the brother Cash on, did 27 years in one of the most dangerous prison systems in the country. He's got a lot to talk about. He's got his lockdown publications, got a bunch of books out. We'll link all his stuff. Make sure you go order his books and check this brother out. But anyway, Cash, tell the people who you are, where you're from, and let's talk about you. I'm Cash. I'm from the ATL. That's Atlanta. Uh, so... I uh I got locked up in 91. I was sentenced to life plus 30 years in state prison in Georgia at uh Reedsville Penitentiary, which is the most dangerous prison in Georgia at the time, and one of the most dangerous prisons in the United States. One of the most dangerous prisons in the country. I tell people all the time, man, two most dangerous prison system, Alabama and Georgia. How old were you when you get sentenced to life? 25. 25 years old, sentenced to life. Tell the people how you end up with a life sentence at 25. Okay, so, uh, you know, I was heavy in the game. That was the crack era, and I was heavy in the game. So, uh, you know, just all the things that come from the street. Really, on my case, I really got found guilty of, it would have been a, a manslaughter charge, but because traffic co co cocaine was involved, that made it a felony murder, because the felony then was trafficking cocaine that made it a felony murder. But the biggest thing behind that was that I was just flamboyant, young. Uh, the police knew exactly who I was. I had been, before that case right there, I had been arrested for like a triple homicide that they believed I did. But then they had to drop the charges on it. So that stemmed from, uh, you know, it all surrounded where one of my children's mothers got robbed by her best friend's boyfriend. And then the boyfriend and two companions of his ended up dead like a, couple, a week or two later in which they, uh, you know, they accused me of having a hand in that. So what I'm in that case, I was actually, the charges was dismissed on me. But when this case came around, they definitely had it in to me, you know, in for me. I'm not trying to say I was innocent because I wasn't, but I should have had a, a manslaughter charge and not a felony murder charge. And they definitely, uh, I shouldn't have been convicted on the trafficking cocaine. Although in truth, it was mine, but they had a lot of say to prove it. The drugs were mine, but they had a lot of prove it. So that was pretty much uh, how I ended up with, I, I went to trial. I was out on bond. I had like a, a two, three hundred thousand dollar bond, but I was out on bond for like a year or something. Then I went to trial. And when I went to trial, I ended up, uh, you know, losing that trial. I got sentenced to life for the felony murder in 30 years for trafficking cocaine with a million dollar fine. Let me ask you this, right? Mm -hmm. 25 years old. Someone gets, obviously, someone loses their life. What's it over, though? What does what, what this person lose their life over? Really, this right here, this was really not, it, it really wasn't, what I got convicted of really was not part of the game. You see what I'm saying? So it really wasn't part of the game. So the person lost their life. It was really an accidental thing. You know what I'm saying? But because the drugs was in the house and all of that, that's how I ended up with that. And because they, you know, they basically had it out for me. Like I said before, not only because of the prior thing, but it was also rumored, which was true, that I was having an affair with a police officer. And so they really didn't like that. 25 years old. Some people end up, you're connected to three or four bodies at 25 years old. That's a, that's a crazy story, right? Mm -hmm, most definitely. Let me ask you this. What goes in, you know, you see a lot of these kids, man, with young thug and all these dudes shooting each other in Georgia. They got the death penalty. It's a felony murder for you. Does it ever go through your mind that, yo, I'm out here in the game. I'm out here in the streets. But if I take someone's head off that I could end up with a, with a, with the death penalty. Does that ever go into the thought process with these young dudes? You mean do, do do it going to their mind? These you're days? Out there money. You ever think you ever think like, damn, if I kill someone out here, I could get the death penalty? Do you even think? No, about that? I, I wasn't thinking about it like that because it was really all about the money. And the thing about me is different now, where people, you know, they kill for clout and everything. So I re I wasn't like that. I was about the money. But back then in the '80s and stuff like that, it was about territory. So you had to protect your territory and everything. And so. I was the type of person, man of my word, do good business, did all that. But if you violate, then I handle what I had to handle. So I wasn't thinking about 
so much like I could end up with the death penalty. I wasn't thinking about it like that because just to be honest, you hardly going to get the death penalty for a black on black crime. Yeah, but my question more was, I wonder if people even think about it. People don't think about the consequences until no. they're arrested, and then people are down there talking, hey, man, they could give you the death penalty. You right, know, right. Probably, yeah, that's absolutely like, Yeah, so, no, I didn't think that. I, and definitely they don't think that, because most of the times you think you ain't going to get caught. And then, uh, you know what I'm saying, even when you're doing something just uh, reckless and everything, you're not thinking you're going to get the death penalty or anything like that. And sometimes you're not thinking, because some things you do are there, you're reacting on pride and emotions and things like that. So you don't even think think things through. So you get that life sentence. What's it like at 25 to walk into one of the most dangerous prisons in the country with a life sentence at 25? Are you like, damn, my life's over? What's going through your mind? Okay, so this is because I knew in Georgia and my attorney explained this to me at the time. So my attorney was Drew Finley, who was like a big, big attorney now. He, as a matter of fact, he represents I think he's part of the young thug and all he does all that, but he was my attorney before he rose to that type of stardom. You know what I'm saying? But so he explained to me that I was going to be eligible for parole. And so I knew, and the older cats who had been in for a while, so I knew I had a chance at parole. So in my mind, I was thinking, I'm not going to die in here. I'm going to get out eventually. So, uh, you know, I wasn't looking like I was never going to get out, but I knew I was going to be in for a long time. That reality hurts sometimes, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Spent the best years of your life in prison. How do you cope with a life sentence, man? What do you do to pass the day? What's life like for cash in, in, in prison? All right. So when I first went to prison, I was still doing the same things that I did on the street. You know what I'm saying? I was selling drugs in prison, just doing prison time, doing it like that. But I always had, uh, you know, I always had good intellect. So I was going to class at school and things like that. But on the compound, I was a known drug dealer. I was a person that had all the work and all of that. So I was doing my time like that, let my attorneys fight my case, trying to get back on appeal and all of that. So I wasn't really looking at it like, hey, I'm never getting out of here. I never had the mindset that I was going to be stuck in there forever. Now, I didn't think I was going to be in there 27 years because you know how it is. You go in, your first hope is I'm going to win this appeal. Then I'm going to get back. If I When I lose the appeal, habeas corpus, you're thinking like that. And then reality set in when people start leaving. You know, I went in, I was married. My wife probably stayed with me about six years. And you know what I'm saying? I had different uh, children, mothers and all of that. But once the people start fading away, then your kids start getting older then you start, realizing, you start realizing how long you actually been in there. That's when it gets real, right? Absolutely. When did you think you would get out? Because, you know, you said you go to the parole board. When did you see the parole board? How long before you got a chance to actually see the parole board or even be considered? Okay, so when I first got locked up, you could come up for parole after seven years on a life sentence. But you wasn't getting out. You weren't getting out. That was just a formality. So... Uh, I came up for parole after seven years. They set me off eight years. And I came up then after 15, got set off five, came up after 20, got set off two, two, one, one, one. So you thought, did you think, all right, I ain't going to make the first one. What did you think in your mind you were going to do about 15, 12? What did you think? Yeah, what I did, I started kind of researching, trying to find out, uh, has anyone ever made it out on parole in seven years, 15 years on a murder and a, and, and a uh, drug charge or anything like that. And what I saw back then was the only people that really made it out in 10 or 12 years on license, they just had drug charges. You know, they didn't have body charges. I've seen, actually, i seen one person that had made it out in like 15 years on a murder charge like that. But they was being, they was also going to be extradited back to their country, and their circumstances was so much different. So I was trying to say, if they could make it out like this, I can too. But it wasn't happening. And then I was getting charges in prison. You know what I'm saying? And different things like that. So uh, you know that stood in my way too, because. But I wasn't getting out. I wasn't getting out in no 15 years. It just wasn't going to happen. Let's talk about that. You're catching charges in prison. Like I said, Georgia prison system, one of the most vicious, most violent. 
What type of charges is Cash catching in prison? Uh, drug charge, stabbing charge, things like that's it. You know what I'm saying? I ain't never catch no other. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't, you know, you've been in prison. So I'm not one of them dudes that jack and all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? So I was catching a drug charge and, uh, and, and stabbing charges. You talk about Jack. Some people watching don't know what that means, but that pretty much means like you ain't with all the talking. You're about that business. You get out of line. This is what it is. There's no talking. Yeah. Okay. So, so when I'm talking about dudes and Jack, I don't know what y'all call them where you is from, but you know the guys that catch the charges for masturbating on the officers. You see what I'm saying? So I went there. I went catching those kind of cards. I was just catching drug charge in prison or stabbing charge. Okay, in the feds, they call it gunning. But anyway. Call, yeah, yeah, you gunning them down to that, too. Okay. But let me ask you about this, like the respect thing, right? When I first went into prison, there was a big respect thing. By the time mm -hmm. I got out 20 years later, respect was out the window. But when right. I said about Jack, you ain't with, I, I mean, were you about that business? There wasn't no talking. Like, if you got out of line, I mean, you were putting that knife in someone pretty much. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then I had a crew, because you know how it is. If you got the money, you know what I'm saying? People going to flock to you. Plus, I had respect from the street. That was the main thing. When I first came to prison, I already people knew me before I even came in there because I had a reputation for in the streets. So, but again, yeah, I got tested before, not tested in no uh, uh, way that will be like disrespectful. But what I mean by that is when it come down to money, a person don't want to pay you for what they got or they think they ain't going to have to pay this or all of that. So, yeah, I did what I had to do. I had a crew in there and I wrote, but the main thing, it was just like, from the streets, what they respected most about me. Yeah, I had a dangerous crew, but they knew I was going to be the first one they seen and my crew would be behind. So pretty much you're kind of like the shot caller for lack of better terms, right? Yeah, but I put in work myself. So it ain't like I'm going to just pay somebody to do this. I I, I put in the work myself too. Uh, no doubt. Who'd you run with, man? What gang? What group? Uh, well, they called us the uh, Carver Home Posse. So that's Carver Homes was like the biggest project in Atlanta. And so that's what they called us on the street. Now, again, we I didn't, uh, when I was dealing, I didn't really sell like weight. I ran drug traps, you know what I'm saying? Where, you know, the guys work for me and we supply a, a, a project area and stuff like that. I, did, I didn't too much deal with weight, like selling weight. So pretty much, man, your your issues were, hey, you ain't paying me. I'm putting that knife in you. You stab someone over them owing you money. How much? Yeah, just, uh, yeah, like, it, it don't matter what it was because you know how it is. It don't matter the amount, how much they owe. It's just the fact that you don't pay. And you got some people in prison, they think they the gorillas. You know what I'm saying? They the bullies, and they think they ain't going to have to pay. Or, you know what I'm saying, they didn't got away with it with other people. So they look at it, and they probably was, in their mind, they think, okay, yeah, I know this cash, and I know he got a crew and all of that, but I'm going to see what, and on the street, I know he did this and that, but in here, it ain't no guns. So let me see what he going to do. And they test me and they found out that I wasn't with that. You ever been, you ever been stabbed before in there? Getting a knife fight and someone yeah, stabbed? Yeah, I've been stabbed. I almost died because I got stabbed and he hit an artery. Talk about that. I'm, what was that over? What was that over? You and dude are beefing over what? Him owing you money? Well, no. Nah. Okay. So I was transferred here to a different prison. Now this had been years. Some of this stuff probably, when that happened, it wouldn't have happened at the prison I was at originally. So this was kind of when the younger guys was coming in and was at a different prison. So I had just got to a prison. And when I got to that prison, I probably had been in there like, I don't know, maybe a week or so. I had been in this particular building for about a week or so. And uh, one of my homeboys, he had stuff going on in there. And uh, some guys, a gang of guys was robbing them. And uh, I was woke up and told this, that, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I, I was kind of, I was, I was strapping up to go handle my business and help them. And but they knew. And, and then they ran in there, and uh, you know, it was a tussle. I was getting to my thing. They ran in there on me. But really, the guy that stabbed me, he only hit me in the thigh because he was like on the ground. He hit me in the thigh, but he hit an artery because you got a main artery in the inside of your back. You know what I'm saying? And that's the only place I got hit at that time. But I definitely almost died. What was it like for you going to the hospital? Were you like, damn, man, I'm about to lose my life here. Well, okay, so I couldn't hardly remember the ride to the hospital. I just remember uh, when I was on the floor 
and they, the emergency people was coming to get me. And the only thing I really did, I remember the last thing I was saying was to tell my kids I said I love them. You know what I'm saying? Because I really, I really thought it was a wrap. Were you afraid? Was there any type of fear? Like, damn, man, my life's over. Was there was there a fear in your heart, or were you content? Like, it's a, this is it. It's over with. Yeah, I think I think I don't know that I had time to process it that way. Like, I was afraid. Of course, I didn't want to die. But I ain't really a nervous type of man, you know what I'm saying? And to start think, I always the thing in me is I always feel like whatever the situation is, I'm gonna come out better than the average person. You know what I'm saying? That's how I always feel about things. That's the confidence I have in me. But in that time, I I did think it was over. With. I really truly thought that I was dying. So crazy life to live, right? How many people mm-hmm. used to be dying? that Georgia State prison. I mean, you actually seen something happen and they die. Uh, three, maybe three people. I just seen, a, uh, I just seen guys drop a buffer. You know, the, you know what a buffer, industrial buffer off a of second range all the way to the first range on somebody and, and go down there and stab them up. And then I seen another person get stabbed up and died later when they took them to the hospital and then some, someone else. So I actually seen two people die. Seen someone and drop a buffer on, you seen someone drop a buffer on someone from up there? Absolutely. How the hell do they not know what's going on? You don't look up like, oh, sh-. Well, okay, so this is, how, this is how they did it. The guy, he got comfortable, and he was like at a card table. You know what I'm saying? And he had his back to the showers, and but the dude... The, the dudes that dropped on them, they cell was like kind of right by the showers right there, the way it was made up. And he saw them, he heard the commotion because he kind of looked back because, you know, a buff of heavy, especially at the bottom, and it cleaned against the rail. But he was like sitting down and he was like, he probably was maybe 6'4", I'm going to say 280. He's a big dude, so he couldn't get up out of that thing like that, and they got him. But that didn't kill him because that kind of hit his shoulder and everything. And then they ran down there and wet him up. Ends up dying after getting stabbed. Yeah. What happens when someone's getting stabbed in prison, brother? They screaming, yelling, fighting back. What do you? What have you seen? Twenty-seven years. What have you seen? All right. So mostly it's like this. Most people go and mind their own business until it's over with. And then even after it's over with, and the person bleeding out. Most of the people are not going to want to even go to the police or anything, go to the booth and alert them. They're not going to want to do that because they don't want to involve themselves in it in no way, especially if it's somebody that is known they deserve what happened to them for whatever violation they made. But you you will have somebody that may go call to uh, alert the officer and they call them in there. But for the most part, people kind of mind their own business. Like early, it was like, when early in my bid, the early parts of my bid, it was territory. Where you from? What city? So it was like Savannah. It was Atlanta. It was Albany, Georgia. It was like that. Now, later, it became gang affiliated. So then it was gang things. You know what I'm saying? Since when, when all of that happened, of course, the killings escalated a whole lot. Because, you know, young guys, they are, they are killed over anything. And it's, and, and it is, and it's, it's, it's always some drama. Back in the day, men dealt with respect, and it, it, it could be a lot of one-on-one things, and it wasn't so much 20 people on one or something like that. It only happened like that as if you, you know, if you was one of them people that just, you know, deserve whatever happened to you. I mean, it used to be that way. If you, if you were looking for it, it was there for you. Now it's you right. don't have to be looking for it. No, you don't have to be looking for it because, yeah, you don't have to be looking for it. Go find you. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. You know, and sometimes like that, you know, like I said, you know, dudes sometimes think they protected by gangs and this and that. Because, you know, when we was at, it was always a lot of cell phones and all this stuff. And so one time a young guy, he was a GD guy, stole my battery. He didn't know me. Obviously, he didn't know me. Personally. And he was just getting high. So they'll, they'll try anything. You know what I'm saying? So when it came out, I ended up stabbing him in the head and everything. But I respected policy because. You know, with the GDs, what I did, they knew he had stolen, but he put it on on their boss like he didn't do it. And it came back that they did. So what all they asked of me was, let me let us jump them out and you can do what you want to do. You know what I'm saying? That's what they asked. I let them do whatever they had to do. And then I did what I had. 
after they jump him out, you go over there and stab him in the head. Yeah, absolutely. It wasn't good enough. Like in the feds, man, you know, your own group might beat you off the yard. It's over with. The dude's gone. He gets stabbed by his own people. In Georgia, they jump him out of the gang, and then you put your you you do what you got to do. That's what they did in that case. Now I don't know if uh it's done like that because I done had some issues with gang things, and sometimes they they do what they got to do. That's right. They will deal with him and then send him, make him go to lockup, and then whatever the violation is that came to me, like money or whatever, then they'll pay it. You see what I'm saying? But then they'll handle it. But in that case, because he had put it on the game and lied, that's what made them jump him out, not because of what he did. So when you're stabbing this dude in the head, is he trying to fight you back, or what, what's going on? He was running and screaming. He, he, You know, you got a lot of cats that might be affiliated like that, but they ain't really about that life. You know what I'm saying? And he wasn't, yeah. Yeah, he wasn't strapped, and I was. Did, you, did it feel like it was harder as you got older? I mean, all these young dudes in there now. I mean, obviously this dude takes your battery, but do a lot of people know you as like, yo, that's the OG. He's got 25 in. He's got 22 in. Do they talk okay. about you like that over there? So, but yeah, that's right. But see, that's why I'm saying. See, and even even though they were gang of fit, in that building, that basically was my building anyway. You see what I'm saying? But he, you know, because he was on drugs, he 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 just tried a, a adult fiend move. And didn't think that it would come out that he did it. You know what I'm saying? But yes, I always had that respect to where they wasn't coming at me like that. You see what I'm saying? Because I'm in, you gotta understand, I'm in there, even when the gangs came in. So you had all the gangs, and then you had the Muslim brothers, which of course ain't a gang, but they're together and everything. But uh I wasn't affiliated with none of it, but I just had respect enough to where they wasn't coming my way because it's people that I was cool with from all set. Let me ask you this, right? I've seen a lot of vicious videos coming out of Georgia, Alabama, like I said. Mm -hmm. There's this one video that circulated. I think I put it up too as a short. Big old black dude's got this white dude sitting next to him. He's kind of like his boy. He's slapping him in the face. And what about mm -hmm. the white dudes? And I interviewed a dude named Jesse James that did 30 years in the federal system. I mean, in the Georgia state system over there. Mm -hmm. He'd be. Um, pretty well-known guy. A lot of black dudes knew him. What's it like for white dudes over there, man, for real? Is it, I mean, is that like the videos that we see? Is it like not it just happens once in a while? Or is the oppression game for real? Oh, uh, it's for real. It's for real, especially, you know what I'm saying? It's real because they so vastly outnumbered. So it's for real like that. Now, when I was in Reveal, like I'm saying, the uh, the gang there, they had Ghostface, they had a &B and all that. Now, you know, they mostly going to ride together, you know, and I mean, they going to ride together. And so they wasn't oppressed like that. But if it was, if it's, if it's a white guy and he's not affiliated like that, you know what I'm saying? Then he mostly going, you know, some white guys that grew up around black guys, they know how to fit in without, you know, all of that being done to them. But you know what I'm saying? They ain't going to, they ain't going to, they, they can't start no trouble. You know what I'm saying? They can't start no trouble. You got a couple of prisons where you got Ghostface there and all of that, where they, you know, them, them white guys right there, they're gonna ride and they they're not they're not bothered. They respect it. And I knew, I knew uh I knew a bunch of A and B's when I was doing my time at Reesville, which is the prison I'm talking about. Well, yeah, they're gonna stick together too. But in Georgia, they always, and like most places, they always vastly outnumbered. And then what they'll do is they'll try to put them together. You know what I'm saying? So say they may be in a building. If it ain't but eight of them on the compound, they'll be together. And they don't really mess with them like that. Well, you're just a regular white dude. You might get your shit taken, all kinds of stuff. Right. If you just a regular white dude and you don't have that flavor like that you ain't been around black guys a lot. You can't just be, you know, uh, Opie Taylor coming up in there. You know what I'm saying? Because it's going to get rough on you then. But you got some white guys that's cool. You know, real cool. And they don't really oppress them, but they be cool with a lot of black guys. And you know how they do it. They might share what they have with them. And you know what I'm saying? But if if you, yeah, if they just a regular white guy, just a regular white guy, and they not affiliated in no kind of way, yeah, they're going to have a problem. One of the worst things you've seen in that Georgia state prison system, one of the most, it don't even mean that they had to die, just one of the most gruesomest things you've seen. What is it? Okay, so... It was a it, it was a stabbing, you know what I'm saying? 
it was a stabbing where it was like four or five guys on one guy. You know what I'm saying? It was just a long time where they got no help from nobody. You know what I'm saying? And so it was gruesome because they stabbed him all in the head and the face. He probably got stabbed 60 or 70 times. You know what I'm saying? I done seen that. I done seen where, what, which I, this ain't gruesome, but it's pitiful to where, you know, when I was at Reedsville, which I keep referring to, they had a dormitory and anybody that was HIV was in that dormitory. So it was a lot of homosexuals over there, a lot of them, and drug users. It was some of them too, but it was a lot. And I done seen dudes, I done seen dudes, it's like this wall that separated because they did not come amongst the people that's in population. But I done seen dudes clam that wall to go over there and mess with homosexuals over there that they know was HIV positive. Out of their minds, man. What are the hell? Yeah, and absolutely. And it's a story. I don't. I can't say this, but it's always been said there was a guy that was over there that he had one of the homosexual guys send him a IV. I mean, not an IV, a, a, a the needle and stuff with his blood in it, so that he could inject it himself, so that he can get HIV positive, and they are moving over there. Man's out of his mind. He needs out of his mind. Issue. He need to go to a mental health institution, right? Absolutely. But, you know, he got life, no parole, but I don't care what it is. You still be a man regardless. 100%. Let me ask you this. You know, you, you do all this time. Your time finally comes. The parole board lets you go, right? What's it feel like to get that paper or get told, hey, man, it's finally oh, here. Man. What's it like? Oh, man. It, I, can't, I can't tell you how that felt because what they did, I had, you know, every time I always have a parole lawyer and everything, but I didn't know. It came back and they said that I was being granted parole. And uh, so usually it's going to be about six months before you go. So I knew that I had made it. But, you know, until you walk out of there, you ain't sure because people have went down there to dress out and go home and never made it home. They didn't let them out. So I was just thinking about it. But the day they called me, like they call, I had got a call out that I had to go see my counselor and go sign the parole papers. I got it the night before, and I went that morning. I'm thinking, okay, probably it'd be about a week, but that was like on a Thursday. I went down there on a Thursday, and uh, she told me I was going home that Monday. You know what I'm saying? And man, I can't even tell you how that felt. I'm talking about, it was like, damn, it's over, finally. You know what I'm saying? And I was finally going home. So I, there ain't no better feeling in the world than that. I feel you. I did 18 straight, brother. I know what it feels mm -hmm. like to walk out, man. And I know what it feels like to think, I hey, ain't never getting out of here. But eventually, right. it happens. You, uh, right. you're out of prison now, living your best life. No the doubt. Seen in prison, though, now that you're out, right? Does it affect you? In your oh, yeah, life? I'm definitely affected. I'm, I'm definitely affected just by the whole experience. You know what I'm saying? For instance, okay, so I did seven years on lockdown, you know, which I would call the, the shoot. Okay, so I did seven years like that. And to this day, I'm most at peace by myself. You know what I'm saying? So it's a part of you that still be affected. And then now when I look back over everything I've done, so now I say I'm on YouTube and I'm watching, you know, uh, different things, true crime stuff and this and that. The biggest thing is now when I look at it, back then when I was doing what I was doing, I never thought about, how what I did to a person affected their family. You know what I'm saying? I never thought about that. But when I see now, like from victim impact statements or years later, mothers especially, they never get over the death of their child. They never get over it. It crushed their soul. But back then, when you I was living that type of life, the way I felt was you get whatever you deserve, good or bad. And so if this person was doing that, they got served what they were supposed to get served. And even though that may be true by street life, and it's still true, you never think about how bad that crushed that mother or something like that. So now today, I look at it, I know I wouldn't get involved in that life or anything, but I wouldn't want to take a life or another life because I could see the damage that it does to their family. I'm glad you said that, man, because some people need to hear that. Absolutely. Yeah. People in your community, people in my community, people need mm -hmm. to think about, you know, what if it was your mother on the other end that had to be right. crushed her soul? When you say crushed her soul, that's got to hit some people, man. You see so many right. people 
street doing this wild, vicious stuff. Them videos where they're beating these dudes and they can't even fight. Mm-hmm. They got dudes tied up in Georgia. They were walking to one black dude around on a leash. He ends up getting out and kills someone later on. You know, mm-hmm. that stuff, man, it's usually you know, like, damn, these people don't have no compassion. You, you no, you don't. You done jumped out and, 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 10 times, man. It's over with. Right. And then you know how that is when you have, when it be this uh, gang, and I'm not talking about necessarily a gang affiliation, just a gang or mob mentality. Everybody going to try to outdo the next person to be as vicious and as careless as they can be. You know what I'm saying? Because they want to set their reputation within the prison system. Some people is in them like that for real. Some people just doing it because they want to set this, uh, you know, they want to they make an example out of somebody to establish themselves. You know what I'm saying? And they ain't think about that. But for, I mean, you know, for the most part, yeah, when you get older and after you didn't did time, a lot of time, then you start thinking about some of the choices you made when you first came in and even before you came in. Crazy. So now you're out, man. Tell the people what you're doing, man. I know you got a bunch of books. How many books you got? Well, I wrote myself 15 books. I started writing when I was in prison. I became a best-selling author. So I probably, like I say, I stayed in the, the hustling and doing all of that for probably the first 15, 12 to 13 years of my prison bid. And then, you know, I was writing them seven years on lockdown. I was doing a lot of writing the books. And everybody that, you know, urban books and all of this, all over the nation, uh, you know, they know who I am, Cash. They know because I'm a best-selling author. And uh, so I started writing in prison. I was signed to Waheeda Clark, who was the number one uh, best-selling uh, author, a New York Times best-selling author. She started her company. I actually had published the book on my own, Trust No Man. And my people were selling it out the trunk of their cars. They ended up in her hands. She asked me to be her first author when she started her company. From there, everything blew up. I wrote four books under her, and then I started my own company, Lockdown Publications, you know, and now we have published 800 books or more. That's what's up, man. I'm going to make sure you send me your links, man. We'll put them in there, you know? Right. It, and we got, I got a movie on Tubi and on, uh, on Amazon Prime. It's called Till My Casket Drop. Real good movie. And I got a TV series coming out this summer, Thugs Cry. Well, you're doing big things, man. Oh yeah, I'm doing that. I'm I'm glad to see you out here free. What do you what did you miss the most, man, when you were in prison to finally come home and get? I know a woman, but what else, brother? Uh yeah, yeah. Oh uh, well, f- the freedom to move around at my own will. You know what I'm saying? To just go. Cause when I first came home, they wouldn't let me parole out to my own place. So I had to parole out to my daughter's place for nine, I think 90 days, and then I was able to get my own house and then I could move to my own place. But I used to get up in the middle of the night back then and just go to Walmart. And she used to say, Daddy, why don't you go to Walmart at 3 o'clock in the morning? And I'd be like, just because I can. You know what I'm saying? So it was just being, I, that's what I miss the most, the freedom to just move and, and, and don't need a pass or permission or, you know, to go here or to go there. And so that's what I miss more than anything. Cash, how old are you now? 59. 59. Your biggest regret mm-hmm. in life, man. You spent the best years of your life in prison. What's your biggest regret? Ever getting in the drug game because everything that I wanted from the drug game, I could have got legitimately if I had patience. What's up, man? Say that one more time. There's some young brothers that need to hear that. Say that one more time. Oh, I absolutely regret ever getting in the drug game and all the things that come with that because everything I wanted, everything, the money, the cars, women, fan, all of that, I could have got it legitimately if I just had patience because I could look at some people that didn't choose the drug game back then and I look at them now and they're successful with what they're doing. So I absolutely uh, regret ever getting in the drug game. Listen, brother, I appreciate you coming on, man, sharing your story, your experiences. Someone need to hear it. This is a good message, man. Someone needed to hear that. Um, okay. I'm going to put your links in there. I'm going to put your movie in there. I want people to go check this brother out, man. He's doing big things. Spent 27 years of his life in prison. But look, you became a change you seek to see in others. You had some rough spots, some rough patches, but you're out here doing good things now, living a good life. No doubt. No doubt. So anything you want to say before we go? No, I just want to tell you that I absolutely salute your platform. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I appreciate what you're doing for the brothers that's locked up, that been through this, the people you try to help and everything, because it's always by trying to do something back for the ones that's left behind. And just to get the stories out there, 
and to be able to say to you or whoever you say, you ain't going to save them all, but somebody. You just say some of them, that's a good thing. So I salute you for that. Definitely appreciate you. And I appreciate your message. I'm going to tell people, man, check his links out. Check his movie out. Check his books out. Blood on the Razor Wire TV with respect. Until tomorrow, we're out. Thank <laughs> you.